Hey, how you doing? Thanks for downloading Garden Fork Radio. This is me, Eric. I'm your host. I have this uh, podcast and a YouTube channel. It's all about eclectic how-to home improvement DIY stuff and what to do when you've you haven't what to do when your basement is flooded. And this just happened to me a while ago, and it just happened to my friend Aaron from the Impatient Gardener. So we're here to tell you our stories of flooded basements. Hi, Eric. So how's your basement right now? Is it dry right now? Oh, it's bone dry now. Okay, good. I have a fully functioning sump pump and a uh, a dehumidifier. Good. Important things to have. I kind of experienced your flooding in real time because you sent me some text messages and photos and I'm like, oh, I'm I'm glad that's not my yard. (laughs) Yeah, it was um, it was rather aggressive. Uh, that is the worst flooding that we've had. Not the most rain, not, not the worst rain event, but the worst flooding that we've had since we've been in our house for, what, 18 years now or something. Uh, so I know that there have been some changes. Well, there's a house just up the hill from us that didn't used to be there. I'm sure you know, since the last time we had a big, heavy rainstorm. But we had somewhere, and I think they said we had seven and a half inches in uh, um Maybe, well, I think it was seven and a half inches over 24 hours, but most of that fell over 12 hours, you know. That's a ton of water. Yeah, that was a lot of water to manage, and it was aggressive uh, coming down. It was amazing to just, we just kind of put our boots on and walked out on the road a little bit. It was wild. And so we've got uh, a little creek that runs through our property, right through the middle of our property, that is essentially, um, we're just, we're just down, we're just the downhill um, outlet to get from the farm fields that are up the hill to Lake Michigan, which is beyond us. So it's, it's just, um, you know, runoff basically. Uh, but when it came, it came fast and, and quickly. So, uh, that was, um, that was interesting. And then, you know, the flooding, the basement did flood. I mean, we kind of were checking on it. The problem is not that it's coming in over the top. It's coming in from the bottom in our basement. So, because oh, the wow. water table, is, the water table is so high, where we are, so we just watch it come bubbling up through the cracks in the cement floor in the basement. And I knew it was going to start going a little bit. It's not uncommon in a really heavy rainstorm to have a little bit of moisture seeping up on the one side of the basement, which is unfinished. Um, but then it started really coming in, uh, and then things went from well. We went outside and we were checking out everything. We we're kind of walking around the neighborhood and we've been, we're trying to sort of manage the stream a little bit, the little creek, which had now turned into like a whitewater rafting expedition. Ah. Um, and just kind of make sure that no logs and stuff were getting clogged in there, that we would back everything up. Cause there's several pretty big culverts that it needs to go through, but you know, a couple of big branches can screw that up big time. So we're figuring that all. And then we came in the house and, uh, my husband went downstairs and he, we frequently check. We have two sump pumps that run almost constantly in spring. Um, and he was standing right there when the one sump pump just gave up the ghost. So that's when things, we would have been fine were it not for the sump pump essentially blowing up. So he went on a, a mad dash to the home improvement store. And uh, fortunately they were open and, um, there were some left, although there was a big line of people doing the same thing we were doing. Wow. And uh, I just stood at home just kind of watching the water come up and do, getting anything that I could out of its path. You know, I, we had picked up anything that couldn't get wet or sooner, but anything else because it kept getting higher and higher and getting to the other side of the basement. So I just watched it come up, and it took him about an hour and a half to make that run. Um, and I took the old sump pump out while he was gone. So we'd be ready to basically throw that new one in when he got back. And uh, in that time, we got about, I would say, six or seven inches of water in the basement. Wow. There were some paint cans. There were some paint cans sitting on the floor. And I can judge there was about, you know, two inches from the top of the paint can were the only parts that were dry. So however tall a paint can is minus two inches. But where we got to. So th- it was shocking shocking how quickly the water came up and had we not been able to get our hands on a sump pump we would have been we would have been looking at a 
a really a major problem. So as it was, it was mostly just clean up. It forced us to clean out the basement. Nothing major got damaged. It was all it was all fine. But it was a good lesson that we never want to be without a, sump, a working sump pump again. So there are two sump pumps and one dies and the other one is running constantly but can't keep up with the water? Exactly. Yep. Are they in different parts of the basement or both nearby, near each other? Nope, they're on opposite they're on opposite sides of the basement. And we sort of talked about it afterwards. The the one that died is the sort of must be like the lowest corner of the basement because that's the one that really does the lion's share of the work and that's in the unfinished side of the basement. Then we have Another sump pump on the other half of the basement, which seems to be higher and drier, generally speaking. And I guess we had sort of thought that, you know, maybe one thing we could have done is moved that sump pump to the other side. Because I think that the side, the sump pump on the lower side of the basement is the more important sump pump. So maybe that's one thing we could have done. But beyond that, I, you know, I mean, really, you just need two that work. So. Yeah, water is extremely powerful. It um it seeks its own path and it seeks its own level. So if the water table is higher than your basement floor, you're, you're not going to beat that. Right. And there is, we were just talking about it today. You know, we were looking at these, these terrible floods that were in Michigan where the dams broke. Um, and of course, I mean, that is just a, a, tr a horrible tragedy and I feel terrible for those people, but you look at that and that's just another one of those examples of you, fighting mother nature is not something that can be easily done and you will almost never win a battle with water because water is going to do what water is going to do. Yeah. I mean, they use water to cut metal now. Do they really? Is that in, what, in a CNC machine or how you know, does that work? It's like a yeah. CNC. It's this jet jet cutter thing. So, yeah. So there you go. I'm pretty sure it's water. I think I saw that anyway. Um, <laughs> It's pretty, it's, it's called a water jet. It's pretty, but anyway, suffice to say, someone's going to email me now. Um, it's radio at gardenfork.tv. <laughs> but yeah, I actually am kind of a hydrology geek. Um, there is a guy on YouTube, I think it's called Engineering Explained. And he has these great models about, he'll talk about a dam or some sort of water related topic. And he builds these models out of clear plexiglass to show you the power of water and how it can move stuff. It's pretty cool. Uh, I'll, I'll, and when I have a minute here, I will look it up, but his, it's just kind of amazing, but I've learned a lot with um, the little weekend house. We put in new foundation walls. So we put in curtain drains and I'm on a hill, thankfully, so the water table doesn't come into play as much. But I think it, with yours, the only thing you can do is have pumps. It's not like you could put in, you could dig some deep drains or something because the it's a water table issue. It's not, it's not rainwater coming up your gutters or something. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So I will tell you that the, the one sort of silver lining in this for us, well, there was there were some bad parts, which is that I'm creating a new garden and literally one week, exactly one week before this, we had just spread 30 yards of topsoil, um, quite a bit of which went straight down the creek into Lake Michigan because I had not had a chance to plant anything yet there. Although, thank God I did because, of course, nothing would have been established. So I would have lost the plants, too. So at least I didn't lose the plants. I just lost a fair amount of soil. Um but what was really interesting is that, um, you know, you could see the areas that were really wiped out with that. And it's, I, I actually have amended the planting plan a little bit there because it's clear to me that, you know, there's definitely one area where that water is going to come across our driveway. And it's not uncommon for, um, it's not uncommon for that to happen maybe once a year when we get heavy rain. So, um, you know, so that was interesting. I'm, always, I'm just fascinated by it. In the spring here, we have, uh, well, when it actually does snow, uh, I don't know with climate change whether that's going to happen ever again up here. But we have, we're in a very hilly area of Connecticut, and the streams just break their banks. And my one buddy has a dirt gravel road to his camp, and with these two 
quite robust concrete pipes with stone across to, to go across a creek. And the water um, washes those out every year. It's just like, and mm-hmm. it's, I just love watching it. And it's just, just, you're like, holy cow. And then the Labradors want to go swimming in it, you know? Yeah, right, right. So, you know, we, I, when my husband ran to go get a sump pump, I said, buy two, because I sort of had already realized, I called him up and I said, just buy two right away, because it occurred to me that I don't really ever want to be without a spare sump pump ever again. But you sent me a link to a product, to a different kind of pump that could be used as a sump pump or what, an inversion pump or something that I thought was a really good idea that would probably be better to have around as a spare because you could use it for more than just a sump pump, correct? Yeah, it's, I actually got mine from Harbor Freight, but I'll, I'll link to it in the show notes here. It's, it can fun. It's it's a regular pump. It's a, you know it's like a eighty dollar or fifty dollar, you know your your cheap pump from Asia, and you can connect it to various diameters of hoses. But the beauty of it is, and it's not just this one model, but most of them you can screw a garden hose onto, and then it has a float switch connected to the side. So when the uh, when it's put into water and you can adjust the depth of the float switch by the length of the cabling it snaps onto the side of the pump when that float goes straight up kind of like a fishing bobber goes straight up uh there's a basically a metal marble in the switch that makes contact with two electrical contacts and it turns on the pump so if you're hardwired you're physically uh, screwed in and glued together sump pump in your sump pit craps out, you can take this, throw it in there, well, you connect a garden hose to it, throw it in there and pump out your basement without having to disconnect the old pump and connect your new replacement pump onto those PVC pipes or that black poly pipe. Mm-hmm. It's it's going to break eventually because it's a cheap pump, but for the next 12 hours, it'll pump the water out Instead of you having to stand in knee deep water trying to re glue PVC pipe to your hard, what I call it hard piped or hard wired sump pump. And then it also, you can move it around the basement. Mm -hmm. And then what I do, which I've done before, when I just need a water pump and have it turn on, is I take the float switch and and I tilt it right side up so that it makes electrical contact. And I take duct tape and I wrap it around the pump. So it's an always on pump. And then I've put that into like barrels or ponds or something that I've needed to pump out. So it's a portable pump and it'll save you. Yeah, I love that idea. And I just think, you know, that's the, that's because that's got, you can use that for more than one thing rather than just having a spare sump pump sitting on the shelf. And like you said, to try to hook up a sump pump when you're half underwater would be a pain. So I kind of, I like that idea a lot of having that, you know, sitting around as your emergency thing to tide you over till you can, you know, get something better going. Right. And then once you get the water out, you, you could fix it. Right. I actually have two of them. <laughs> so, cause I have a story too, but uh, like the other day, my buddy has a shallow well and he wanted to um, clean it out. They just get kind of gunky you know, standing water. And so we used this pump. Again, I just took the duct tape and strapped the floating, the floating switch around the housing and we lowered it down and we, we pumped out the pump, the pumped out the well so he could clean off the rock and everything. And it's, it's paid for itself several times. I imagine by now you've heard me talk about the Garden Fork patrons and the pre-show and the after show. And I thought I'd give you like 30 seconds of what that's all about. Basically, there are people that listen to the show that contribute to the continued production of the show on a monthly basis. Kind of like, uh, you know, like NPR or PBS where you sign on for X number of dollars a month. Like I'm a member of PBS and it's six dollars a month. And for that, I get access to the older episodes of like Nova and their science and history shows and that kind of thing. With Garden Fork, if you sign on for $5 a month or more, if you have more, that would be uh, quite nice. 
Um, but if you don't, do not do that, okay? But for that, I send out just kind of the mind of Eric kind of emails that also can show up on the app if you get the Patreon app. And also the pre-show and after show when I record a show with other people, because invariably uh, Aaron and I or Will or Rick and I are talking about something else after the show because we forgot to talk about it in the show. And that's sometimes fun. Uh, it's really fun to listen to Rick tell me what I'm doing wrong with the show, but in a good way, because you need feedback like that. But you could also provide that feedback uh, becoming a patron. So that information is in the show notes of today's episode. You can also go to patreon.com slash garden fork for more information about that. All right. So think about that and we'll go back to the show. See ya. So tell me about your basement flooding story. Um, well, it's a couple years ago now, but my, it was in Brooklyn. And the first thing you have to know about a lot of cities is that their uh, wastewater and water runoff, uh, the sanitary drains, the sanitary sewers, and your water runoff drains are all tied into the same pipe. So the roof of our row house, it's a flat roof and it's tilted slightly, the downspout is connected to the sewer line that goes through the basement of the house. And we're watching TV. My Actually, my sister was visiting. And I hear what I think is a, sounds like a dishwasher running somewhere. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm not washing the dishes, you know? And I'm like, what? what is that sound? And so I go to the basement door and I open it up and there's, there's an inch or two of water in my basement. And there's stuff floating around. And I'm like, what is going on here? Because I have, oh, I forgot. I got to back up. I have a uh, in the floor, very robust sump pump. It's a $250 sump pump right next to the uh, steam hot water heating system of the house. Because by code, with a steam hot water system, you have to have a sump pump right next door in case the pu the 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 boiler cracks open you can pump the hot water out of your house instead of flooding your house but it is hard piped or hardwired into the sanitary sewer so this pump is creating the dishwasher noise and i'm like it's running mm -hmm. but the basement is flooded because the rain from the downspout is coming down and the last trap which is underground going out the front of the house through the sewer line is clogged. So rainwater is flooding my basement. It goes into the sump pump. The sump pump then just pumps it into the sewer line. And since it's backed up, it there's a slop sink at the very front of the thing. And it's just geysering out of the slop sink. So oh. I, I, you know, it's still raining. I can't stop the rain. The pump is just circulating from the sump pit up into the sewer line through the the slop sink. So my wife and my sister start bailing with buckets and I hopped in the car and thankfully the orange store is open 24 seven in Brooklyn. And I got this El Cheapo pump and I dropped it in and I thankfully had a long enough garden hose and I pumped out the basement, but, and now I bought two of those <laughs> for Brooklyn. Now. Yeah. And then I had to call the the guy to snake out the line because the trap is pretty big. And I'm like, I'm, I was so tired and it could have been a clog that where the, the, my sewer connects to the sewer main, you know, and he opens up the little clean out and he jams a screwdriver down in there and it goes boop, and the water drains. And that was $180. <laughs> oh. But that's where I got the idea of everyone should have a spare sump pump because it's worth, it's worth the 50 or 80 bucks 
because just your basement's wet. You got to run your dehumidifier. You got to get your sh your shop back out. It's such a pain. It, it might save you one day. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And well, you know, I'm I'm fairly confident that rain occurrences like this are going to become more common. So I, you know, I, I don't think this was any sort of you know, although it might seem like an anomaly right now, I think you know in in future years we will be seeing that more and more and more. So. I've also seen a lot of basement flooding when people's downspouts become disconnected and mm -hmm. they basically are dumping rain right next to the basement wall instead of getting it away from it as well. Um, my Actually, my neighbor in Brooklyn had that problem for years. The next door neighbor wouldn't let anyone in their house. It was that kind of person. And mm -hmm. whenever it rained, their downspout would flood the neighbor's house. The nice neighbor was trying to get it fixed. And... They finally convinced the lady to get a plumber in there, and it took five minutes because they just cleared out the downspout. Oh, man. <laughs> the five minutes to fix that. It's a five-minute fix. Yeah. All that, all that damage and hassle and everything yeah. else. Wow. So kind of a tangent on this is, is the power of water and how nature will always win. Mm -hmm. And I have been... We've been up at the weekend house for quite a while now, uh, working remotely. And I've also had time to get to projects I could never do up here because you're only here for a weekend every once in a while. So I've been pulling out in these kind of semi-wooded areas around the house, the uh, the briars or the, they're basically wild berries, wild raspberries or blackberries or something because the mm -hmm. dogs get in there and they get stuck. So I've been, <laughs> I've been taking them out with a shovel. I've been pulling the roots out and I've, I've done a huge area, but within the last couple of weeks, I've noticed nature coming in, in the form of other invasives and taking over because it's an open space. And yeah. As they say, nature abhors a vacuum and so, that goes for weeds too. <laughs> so Virginia creeper is the big one right now. Mm. And, um, it has really long vines that are subterranean, you know? <laughs> and then we also have um, the mustard garlic, garlic mustard coming in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's amazing. And that's why, you know, and that's why with those invasive species, it's so hard to sort of correct that problem because, you know, every time you pull one out, there's another invasive species waiting to just, you know, take advantage of that bare spot of grass with or bare spot of soil um, by, you know, getting in there. There's a reason why they're weeds, I guess. Yeah. And so it's kind of made me rethink things. Um, I'm just going to focus on the edges of the yard where the grass ends and the rest of it. I'm like, whatever I do in the long run, I'm going to lose. So I can pull out the yeah. garlic. I can pull out the garlic mustard. The other invasives, I think, I'm just going to have to live with. Yeah, and I think some are easy. Some are better to live with than others. You know, some might have some sort of value to them. Things like things like garlic mustard are um, particularly tough because um, garlic garlic mustard um, is a allopathic, and it has this chemical in it that actually inhibits the growth of other plants. So it makes it like extra hard for other native species or something you might want to grow there to grow in that to grow in those spots so garlic mustard and plus you know what the thing about garlic mustard weed is honestly i'd rather pull garlic mustard weed than raspberry wild raspberries or whatever kind of you know bramble you've got going on there because it's it's not super hard to pull it's just so prolific that it gets onerous you know yeah the briars are a uh, pain but um oh those are terrible I've got it down to one small, probably like a, uh, like a six foot square area now. And I'm like, okay, I'll work on that later. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And unless you want to go to a situation where you start smothering something, you know, where you do like the cardboard thing and then mulch on top of it. I mean, you can do those things, but if it's not an area, you know, I mean, if it's just like an open area that you're just trying to sort of clear some of that stuff out, 
you know, that you don't necessarily want that to just remain open either. And maybe you don't want to take the time to, or spend the money to plant something else kind of thing, you know? So it's a, it's a, it's a tough call, but you know, you're right. I think at some point you do have to just sort of pick your, pick your battles in the yard. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. I'm not going to pick a battle against, uh, water again anytime soon i think i have more soil being delivered to my house either today or tomorrow so that's good <laughs> spread some more <laughs> yeah you have to watch the weather now right well it was supposed to come today and i and i did not get a call from him and that's good because it's raining quite a bit and i thought oh my god if this if i have to watch more soil get washed away um you know what's really interesting this is sort of strange I had been doing a fair amount of weed suppression under that area as well so I had laid down a lot of cardboard in the area and then we had topsoiled um just a couple of, in some areas it was just a couple of inches of topsoil over the top of it hmm. and all the topsoil went away and not a single piece of cardboard was moved huh and I, I don't understand I don't know if the water came so fast that it just went right over the top of the cardboard and the you know and the the soil just went with it, but it was it sort of an interesting observation? Cardboard wins. <laughs> right. I guess. <laughs> well, all right. I think people have arrived at their, de Oh, I'm going to say they arrived at their destination. A lot of people aren't driving to work these days. Well, maybe they're done riding their exercise bike or doing whatever they do when they listen to the podcast. Their, their solitary walk, getting away from their families. Right. Right. Anyway, it'd be fun to hear from you. I and you could tell us, Aaron and I, your uh, water basement flooding nightmare, and then we could read that on the air. You know, maybe even you could be on the show. And if there's a hydrologist listening, that would be really cool. So water is kind of amazing. So, um, Aaron and I are going to um, break off now. We're going to do our after show for Garden Fork patrons, but you can find both of us at the in the garden fork facebook group and then aaron aaron puts out more videos than i do it's it's exhausting your youtube channel the impatient gardener is going really well yeah <laughs> you know this time of year it's easy to come up with gardening content not so much in december but this time of year there's there's a lot of gardening stuff to talk about but in the december we can you always show us your basement right <laughs> Okay, I'm sure that would be a scintillating, a scintillating, right? All right, everyone, go out and do cool stuff and then come back and tell us about it. It's radio at gardenfork.tv. Thanks for listening. Garden Fork Radio's executive producer is Jimmy Goots. You can find more information about Jimmy and the custom hollow books he makes at hollowbooks.com. Our theme music is used under license from uniquetracks.com. Other music used in the show is used under license from audioblocks.com. Mm -hmm.